Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, before we get into this evening's lecture, uh, just want to remind you that this is the last session before the holidays. Uh, we will reconvene on January the 7th. Um, we're going to start the year, the new year off with a bang. Uh, we have one of our lived it lectures, uh, and it's going to be John Abelay, who is the founder and chair of Boston Scientific, a multi-billion dollar uh, life sciences company. Uh, and I think John's going to have some interesting tales to tell us uh, in the, the lived it series. But um, to tonight's business. Um, Managing your career um, is obviously a topic that's uh, of interest to everybody because uh, it doesn't matter what sector you're in, you, you know, every, we've all got a personal career to manage. And I am delighted to welcome back two very good friends of, of, of Mars uh, here this evening. Uh, we have two speakers, uh, and I assume this is going to be a tag team uh, approach. Um, let me first introduce Teresa Snellgrove. Um, Teresa's bio says she's a managing director in Boyden, uh, Boyden's Toronto office where she specializes in senior level searches in emerging growth companies, but that doesn't really do justice to what Teresa has done. Teresa, um, like many of the speakers here, actually started out as, a, as an honest scientist and engineer. Um, she um, got a BA from McGill, an MA PhD from U of T, and her PhD included the development of one of the very first structural analysis software packages. But she has followed a, an interesting pathway, and I think there's a lesson in there in terms of careers. Um, Teresa and her husband, uh, Timothy, uh, followed the, uh, founded the appropriately named Timothy's Coffees of the World. And there is a bit of a theme in this course about coffee because you've heard from, from Sean O'Day from Second Cup. Um, and I don't know if Teresa's going to talk about coffee at all tonight. Uh, tonight. But um, that, was, uh, that won a Canadian Enterprise of the Year award. Uh, and Teresa uh, ran, uh, uh, was awarded a Chatelaine Woman of the Year. They, uh, Teresa and Tim, went on to co-found a couple of other companies. Um, and then Teresa moved into uh, basically the um, management recruiting business. And she has run with, uh, with, uh, with Tim uh, and, and others their own firm for a number of, of years. And they have, um, they have placed normally senior level, uh, C, the so-called C-level executives, uh, in a variety of um, uh, high-tech ventures, but a real focus on serving technology ventures, entrepreneurs, understanding what it takes to lead a, a little startup uh, or to really uh, work effectively in a startup, and in fact, uh, place people in the venture community. Uh, and that leads us to our second speaker tonight, um, Fred Sweeney. Um, and Fred... Um, Fred has been actually been very closely involved in actually helping me um, run this course in, in years past. Fred has a um, two-year-old, one-and-a-half-year-old PhD, relatively freshly minted PhD, very fresh, uh, in molecular and medical genetics from, from U of T. Uh, he was a Terry Fox scholar. Um, uh, his, his expertise is in, in cancer-related phenomena. Um, but Fred is someone who, when he came to this course, was interested in not just being a lab rat, but moving into more business and venture-related um, uh, opportunities. And, and he got a gig in a Toronto-based boutique uh, um, investment bank. Uh, and then has parlayed that into his current position where he's on the life sciences investment team at Vengrowth, which is one of Canada's uh, biggest uh, venture capital funds. So I think Fred represents someone who has carefully managed his career and transitioned from research into the investment community uh, and he brings, uh, I think, a perspective of how to uh, how he's done that. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome Teresa. I guess you're off. For, you're on first. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's 
hope all the various accoutrements are working. Does this work? The, this? Great. Wonderful. Okay. Managing your career is not an oxymoron. You can do it. We all get buffeted around by various forces outside of ourselves. But I'm a strong believer that we can eliminate a lot of the risk that is attendant on moving from job to job by following certain principles, and we will talk about these, obviously, um, as we move along. So basically, I'm going to talk, about, um, talk a little bit about the search practice, the, the industry, what, what you should look for when you're, if you decide to use a search firm, what the pitfalls are, and what the benefits are. And then I'm going to talk about selling yourself, um, marketing yourself as a product as you go out and look for your next job. And then Fred is going to talk about um, bridging the gap between science and business uh, and the importance of networking. I'll talk a little bit about networking too because I think it's, it's the key um, to making the, the moving ahead in your career uh, by meeting people and building relationships. And I'll harp on that a little bit. <clears throat> And then if we have time, we'll talk about a survey that we did actually last year. Uh, we approached the CEOs of, uh, I think we did about 12 or 13 of the biotechs across Canada and asked them what, why they thought they'd been successful, what were the things that propelled them ahead in their career, and what were the things that they felt were drawbacks. I'd like to take the temperature of the audience first, please. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'd love a show of hands. Um, are there any students in the room who are actually looking for their first job? So it's about seven or eight, OK. Uh, how many people have had a job for one or two years and are now beginning to wonder whether it was the right role for them to take? Anybody in that boat? Okay, about the same number. Um, how many of you are thinking of making a career move, either forced or not, in the next two years? Great, good. You've gone to the right building tonight. Um, how many of you think you have your dream job? Oh, well, great. <laughs> um, and how many feel that if they are going to be looking, how many, sorry, how many people are actually looking for a job at this very moment? Okay, make sure you get my cards when you leave, okay? <laughs> um, and the last question is, um, how many of you, if you are anticipating doing a career move or have done a career move recently, have felt you have serious obstacles in your path in order to get to where you want to go that you have to overcome? Okay, good. So I guess the first thing you have to decide when you're looking for a job is knowing what you really want. And that sounds pretty axiomatic, but sometimes we don't know exactly what, what kind of job we want to do, what kind of title we even want, but also what kinds of jobs are out there, because there often are companies and jobs that we don't even know exist, um, and they are, they are there for the taking. Uh, the world is moving at such a dramatic rate, as everybody knows, that there are jobs today that didn't exist two, three, four, five years ago. So the first thing is to, to know what you want. And in order to know what you want, you have to know what you're good at. And I won't go you know, plow that field very much, because I think you've all probably read books like What Color Is Your Parachute, which say that you need to be able to uh, list your, skill, your skills, your transferable skills, and your, your actual technical skills, marry those with what you really feel passionate about, and then find that spot within the world out there where there is a market for those kinds of skills and those kinds of, of dreams. Um, if you don't know exactly what you're really good at, uh, I would really suggest you go through, go through all the jobs you've had and look at the ones that you've done well at and figure out what were the skills that you used to excel in those areas. In terms of finding out what your passion is, I think most of us know that we have ideals and dreams and things that we want to accomplish in this world. And often if we feel that we're a bit jaded and cynical, it's always worthwhile going back to your youth and figuring out, well, what, was I, what did I really want to do when I was small? And it might have been a fire engine driver. 
Um, and maybe you don't want to be a fireman, but you want to have a role where you are in going to rescue somebody in a fire. Uh, look at your, when you're thinking about your career, do not neglect to look at the whole of you um, going back to when you were small. Knowing how to get it um, is often not A to B or to C. Uh, you need to know the resources that you need to get the job. You need to know what kind of people to access. You need to know what other resources like recruiters, et cetera, out there. So really knowing who you are, what you want, and then setting an action plan to get it. Um, getting a job is much easier if you break the task down into small, subtasks. So if you say you want to have a job at the end of March, then you will start doing the things today that are going to get you there in March. So at the end of a week or a month, you know that you've done all the behaviors such as networking, such as tweaking your resume, such as going to industry events, whatever it is, you've done all those little small behaviors to get where you want to go. Uh, getting people to help you I think most people intuitively want to be helpful, but often they don't know how to be. So if you do meet somebody and you are looking for a job in a specific industry, don't be afraid to say, I want to work for J&J, &J, or I'm anxious to get a, a networking role at Cisco. Be quite specific so that people know that, oh, I know somebody at J&J, &J, I know somebody at Cisco. Uh, because I think people do genuinely want to help, but it, you need to ask the, or tell them the, the important information so that they can. Uh, differentiating yourself from all the others looking for similar jobs. Um, as a recruiter today, I can't tell you the number of people that come through my office door who have lost their jobs for whatever reason. So there's a lot of talent out there. So if you're looking for a job right now, you're going to be competing against some of the best of the best. So you need to make sure when you do get in front of that person who might be able to hire you, you need to position yourself such that you're different from all the other people that they see. And we will can talk some more about that. So differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself by being able to highlight your skills and your achievements, and also to point out, uh, also to show, to, to learn how to be memorable in front of people. Uh, the next um, bullet point, having realistic expectations, and relates to sort of that. Um, we all want to get the best job that we want, and we always can't get it. So sometimes we take jobs that don't um, necessarily use all our skills or that we're not necessarily happy in. Uh, a lot of people would say, who would be on this podium talking about career management, career search uh, skills, uh, don't, don't settle for something less. I think in today's economy, you can't always get the best job that you want, but you can use jobs as stepping stones to something else. So a little bit about search firms. We've just put three types down, that, three examples down there. There are the staffing firms that would do scientific roles, technical support roles, um, and they are very useful for exposing you to a lot of different jobs that might be available. Uh, and I'm sure many, have many of you used a staffing firm before? Ever? Okay. Was it a pleasant experience? Very. Very? very yes. Oh, good, good. Because um, sometimes, and I will talk about this, sometimes using recruiters is not a pleasant experience and because uh, there are many different types. There's the contingent firm, and I don't know if you all <clears throat> know the difference between a contingent and a retained search firm. The contingent firm uh, will be hired by the client firm to find somebody to fill a role, and they will go out and they will ask three or four firms to also look for that person. And the contingent firm will not be paid until that person actually accepts the job. So there's not often um, a lot of motivation for the contingent firm to really look for an excellent candidate. They might think that, oh, if I just put enough people in front of the, front of the client, they'll hire somebody. There are good contingent firms out there, um, but there are, are some that are not. And you need to do your research, and I'll come back to that on this. Then there are the retained search firms, and you've probably heard of um, the well-known ones like Corn Ferry, Ray Bernstein, Hydrogen Struggles. Um, and the way the retained 
search firm works, actually. Um, the client comes to the, retain to the search firm and says what they're looking for. And in the retained search firm, the, that firm will then go to the client firm and spend a lot of time with the client assessing what the needs are, getting to know the rest of the management team or the, or the board or whatever. So it really is a consulting type of relationship. And so therefore, um, all the way along the line in the process of finding the person for that role, uh, it's, it's very much um, every weekday we speak to you and, and it's, it's a quite different process from the contingent one. A lot of people come to us, and, and we've been in the search business for about 12 years now, without a job, and they think that we can find them a job. We can't find somebody a job unless we have a search for that specific job, because it's the client who pays um, the bill for that, that search. Some firms will uh, say to you, if you pay us $2,000, we'll find you a job. And I would urge you, if, if any says that they will get you a job to look at that with a little bit of skepticism because I, I've spoken to a lot of people who have bought into that and then not been able to get a job. So it, it's really important that you know the different kind of firms that are out there and the way they work because that, that, that means they have different motivations. So who pays? The client firm pays the recruiting firm to find the, the, the um, person. Um, and the other thing I didn't mention about the retained search firm, it's called retained because the, the client will pay the search firm some money up front to get started on the search. And then most often, again, the, the, the client does not pay the search firm until somebody's actually hired, but it, it's, a, it's a different business model. How can I get my foot in the door? Well, I would urge you all, as you're starting out in your careers or if you're further on in your career, to try and get to know two or three people in a different search firm because they will become more or less your like a coach, like consultant, and they'll have your interests at heart. So if, if, and, but that means that it is a relationship. So even if you're not looking for a job, it behooves you to get in touch with that person over time and say, this is what's happening to me, or sending them a, a note about what's happening in your industry or in your company. I met with somebody today so I never actually placed anywhere, but he was downtown, and he's very happy in his job, and he just came in, and you know, he'd made an appointment, and we talked about where he, what he was doing and where he was going, and, and I'm always, if somebody wants to have that kind of rela relationship, I'm there with open arms. Those are the kinds of people I want to have in my orbit, and I'll do anything to help them, even if, you know, I can't give them a job, but, so see, if you're looking at search firms as, one more tool in your arsenal of finding a job, pick ones that are good, and it's not the firm, it's the actual consultant. Um, so that's not always easy to do, um, but you, if you, you, you can start and hopefully get your foot in the door by getting calling and seeing if you can set up a meeting and just going in and meeting somebody, even if they don't have a, a job for you. Not easy, but not it's not certainly possible. So it really is all about relationships, and as I said, the, the business of search is fraught with sometimes not very good practices, but for me, the joy of it is you really do feel you can help people not just get a job, but manage their career, give them advice. You often hear of other jobs that are, or searches that are going on that you can point them to, but it is all about relationships, and what you put into the relationship uh, will come back to you in spades. So I want to tell you a little bit about, um, as Tony said, I was, uh, Tim and I had our own firm for 12 years, and we focused on entrepreneurial companies and the venture capital companies that backed them. So those are some of our typical clients. You know OGI, probably most of you in this, in this building. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, GrowthWorks, uh, a VC in, in, in town. Ecosol is a tech company up in Ottawa, very interesting um, battery-related company and uh, larger firms like CML, CML Healthcare, which uh, are like MDS labs. They have blood specimen collection labs all over the city and medical imaging. So I've moved from that world, which was, we're always talking to entrepreneurs, which is really, to use the sandbox analogy, 
the place I like to play with entrepreneurial people, um, into this world of large global companies. Um, Boyden is uh, a, the eighth largest search firm in the world, although you've probably never heard of it. They haven't had a big presence in Toronto. Um, but they've got uh, 70 offices in 40 different countries, and I'm finding it very interesting being in involved with that because we have a life sciences practice, which is global. We get on the phone um, every, every month, sometime every two weeks, and talk about um, what's happening in the different countries in biotech and life science. Uh, and at the moment, I'm involved in writing a paper on R&D and innovation and uh, entrepreneurism. Um, so it's, it's stimulating from that respect, but it is very different from having a two-man, three-man firm, four-man firm um, with partners all over the world. So if any of you are going to Shanghai or Dubai or anywhere or want some connections there, I'm the person to speak to. <laughs> so how to sell yourself. Um, this poor little monkey, he's got a knot in his tail. I'm not sure if he's been swinging around a tree or why, but um, all of you probably have been in this situation at some point or other in your life where you have a job, and especially in this economy, um, you're not terribly happy there uh, for a variety of reasons, but what your job does give you is stability and perhaps the promise of promotion. Um, but you're stuck there because you are afraid to take those initial steps to go out and look for something else. Uh, so if that's sort of the space that you're in, um, I urge you to do some reassessment and reevaluation to figure out what it is that you're afraid of. Um, is it the fear of not getting a good job or is it the fear of not having uh, an income? and really evaluate how large that fear actually is. Um, one thing I often do if I'm nervous about doing something is just taking a piece of paper and writing down what that issue is and saying that what, on one side of the paper, what is the worst thing that can happen? And then on the other side, what is the best thing that can happen? And nearly always, the best thing outweighs the worst thing. So, um, we often do have to stay in a situation because we are afraid to make a move, but I urge you, if you are in, in that, feeling that, to try and get some strategies around getting out of it. Um, in your job search, um, don't, don't go into your job search if you're trying to avoid conflict in the office. Often, many people I speak to, usually if I say, well, what's your feeling about, about the job you have now? It's nearly always, well, I don't get along with my boss. Um, but if you, let, if you have a boss that you don't like in one job, quite likely you might get one that you don't like in your next one. So um, never, I don't think you should ever leave a job just because there's conflict or, or unless it's harassment. Um, but do leave a job if you don't feel you're being paid enough, uh, if it's not intellectual enough, if you're bored rigid at it. Um, if you feel it's getting in, in um, it's conflicting with your life work balance, there are a lot of great reasons to leave, leave a job. But the worst is really being in this position of that monkey and not knowing exactly what you want to do. So should I stay or should I go is the dilemma that many of us feel. And again, it, it becomes even more compelling in today when so many people don't have jobs and you feel you're lucky to have a job. So you, it's all obviously all personal. Um, ages ago, I read a book by this man, William Bridges, um, which I found quite compelling and which I think really speaks to how you want to can market yourself, uh, sell yourself as a product when you are looking for another job. Um, so the next couple of slides, look at you as a product. So it's basically like if you were doing marketing a widget or marketing a mass spectrop, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, so the first thing you need to do, and, and this is really, really important. When you start on this search, you need to know what value you're going to bring to the potential, your next potential employer. So many of those resumes that I see say, I am looking for. Well, your employer isn't 
couldn't care less, future employer couldn't care less what you're looking for. They want to know what you can bring to them. So you need to know what values, what value you bring. Um, and conversely, what val what, why is this search important to you? And the market, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, as I said, the first job is rarely the ideal one. Um, so sometimes you need to, to stick it out a bit longer. Um, don't discount jobs that you feel you're not always qualified for. Uh, there's a, a word in the search business that's now the title of the most recent Malcolm Gladwell book, which is Outliers. Um, quite often when we do a search for a company and they say, we want the person to have all these qualifications, all this set of experience, um, we'll present somebody who doesn't fit that but has an exceptional personality or an exceptionally different, different kind of experience for whatever reason. And frequently the client will say, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. So if you see a job where you're not totally qualified for, I don't not apply. Um, always better to try than not because you never know. Um, and I think for many of people who are just starting out um, that this, the, the vicious cycle is you can't get a job because you don't have the experience. And as you've all, also all probably heard, uh, people often volunteer and find different ways of getting into a company and getting some, getting some experience that they can put on their, on their resume. Um, so don't um, neglect that. And the final thing is I think sometimes when we're looking for jobs and things, we tend, and not meaning to, become kind of a job beggar. Um, you know, I want this job and feel that we're sort of pleading for something. Uh, but it, it's, the company should just be as pleased to have you as, the, as you want the company. And the piggyback to that is try and do as much due diligence as you can about the company before you join. I don't know if any of you have had a picture of a company, you know, before you've started working there, and suddenly once you're in there, you discover all the dysfunctionality and all the things that really um, don't make the, the job that pleasurable. Um, creating your own marketing plan. Um, so you've got your goal. Um, you know what kind of uh, companies you want to target. Um, and, you know, it might be geographically limited or limiting, or it might be sector limiting. Um, and again, I come back to this idea of a plan. Make sure you have an action plan set out where you're keeping a record of the people you're speaking to, um, the companies that you've ID'd on the internet or whatever, and be systematic about it. Because if at the end of the day you don't feel you're making progress, if you look back at this plan and see all the things you've done, you know you're doing the right thing and eventually you're going to get to the, the place that you want to go. Um, communicating who you are and what you're good at. And we have here in brackets the elevator pitch which there's another slide on, and it's the slide that always fills me with absolute horror because if somebody always says, can you give me an example? And I can never think of an example. They're really hard to write. What you want in an elevator pitch, I'm sh have you all heard of the elevator pitch before? Anybody not heard of it? Okay. Well, the, the premise behind it is that you are going to the top of the CN Tower or some other building, and you're standing there, and somebody you know gets on, um, and you realize that this is somebody who might be able to help you in your job search. So you want to sell yourself from the time it goes from the bottom of the CN Tower to the top. So you've got to be concise and <laughs> succinct and all the rest of it. And they're really hard to write. And I don't think I've ever done a successful one for myself, actually. But it is, it's a very useful sound bite, a little bit more than a sound bite that you need to craft and be able to say about yourself. So really, a little bit of self-promotion in a nanosecond, if you will. Because uh, you never know when those opportunities are going to come by that you might see somebody whom you recognize, and you want to go up and introduce yourself, and you want to say something that's compelling. Um, networking, which I think Fred's going to talk more about, um, but I can't stress this. Um, this aspect more. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I know I'm going to run out of time. Um, 
yeah, I'll keep going, going. Industry, you, you all know that you need to go. You've come to things like this. Has anybody in the room introduced themselves to the person they're sitting next to tonight? A. <laughs> do that, and I don't know if you all have cards, but do carry cards because they really are a good reminder of the people that you've met. Uh, and this whole series is such a great way to meet people. I think you all come from sort of scientific and technolo technological um, sectors. But if you, you, know, you do that, you're going to expand your network by billions. <laughs> um, so you know, if it comes difficult, difficult to you to do that, try to get over it because it's so important. And I can talk more about that, but I won't. The elevator pitch we're going to ignore. Anybody want to talk about the elevator pitch? <laughs> Good. Um, the elevator pitch is not just for elevators, um, but when you introduce yourself, being able to, you don't just say, um, I'm a C++ programmer, but say, I do programming for whatever, and I, I don't know, some, something that qualifies how good you are at it. Um, when you leave a voicemail uh, in an interview, obviously, it's, it's really a question of, of putting a brand on yourself, basically. Uh, so try to learn how to do that. So um, my take home is clarify your career objectives. Make sure you know exactly what you're looking for, because if you don't know what you're looking for, you're, you're not going to find it. Uh, keep your CV tweaked. Um, and by that, too, I mean make sure you have multiple versions of your CV uh, that reflect different things that you've done. So if you're targeting a bench science role, that's one thing. If you're targeting pro um, you know, a team lead, that's another. Because, you, again, you can't make your, aside from articles and papers and stuff, your, your CV has to be relatively short. So have as many CVs as you think you necessarily need. Maintain industry knowledge. Again, that's a given. Um, and I'm finding it every day. I have more and more uh, emails that come in telling me what Bear is doing or what Targant is doing or, or whatever. And it, I think it's important to keep on top of that if you can. Uh, network, network, network. Um, and feel good about your accomplishments. Because um, you've all got degrees, I presume, either undergraduate, graduate, or various levels. I mean, you, you've come so far already. You're, you all have so much to offer. And uh, if you don't feel good about your accomplishments, have faith that you're going to be able to learn how to market them properly. Um, and don't forget um, family and friends, because they can be great allies as you're looking for a role, a new job. Um, they, they'll be in, in your corner giving you all the support that you can. So I'm going to pass it over to Fred. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll start with just a small disclaimer. I mean, this, this, my part is more like a um, case study type. So this is how I lived it. It's very subjective. So if you guys have any questions, comments, you disagree, just feel free to, uh, to jump in. And um, as I was listening to uh, Teresa talking, she had a very, very good point. I mean, Mars, and especially Entrepreneurship 101, is a great way to, uh, to get to know people. Most of the, the biggest reason why I'm here right now is because of Mars. All the people I knew, and especially Entrepreneurship 101, so I really encourage you to just you know, s come in, talk to people next to you. You never know who, you, uh, who you're going to meet and who is going to be helpful two, three years down the road. So um, the reason why I'm here is to talk about this big question here. So how to bridge the gap between science and business? Uh, a year and a half ago, or two years ago, I was, uh, I was a lab rat. Like, I was, I was in my lab um, a lot of hours, and I was kind of, I was looking around, and I was like, well, it's, it's very intellectually challenging. I just don't fit with people around me. Like, I don't, I don't feel like I want to, like, eat and breathe that for the rest of my life. So I was wondering, you know, what, what, what is, interests me? And I quickly realized that this, the whole science uh, is, uh, is great, but linking the business and the science for me was very, very, uh, very appealing. And um, I've, I'm going to talk a bit about that a bit later, but um, I started going to Entrepreneurship 101 in 2005, I think. The first year Mars was, uh, was functional. 
And I re this, this lecture really caught my attention because I was very fascinated by how people are going to put millions of dollars in companies that won't have a product for the next seven or eight years. So how can you take that bet? How can you make this educated guess and hopefully down the line be very successful? So I said, oh, well, that's easy. I'm going to become a VC, right? So uh, <laughs> I quickly learned that uh, so my naivete uh, uh, because um, there's a big problem. Like I was a purely, I was coming from academia. So what were my business skills? So, uh, whoops. There's a, a few issues that I, I, come, I came uh, across. And the biggest thing that I've learned and I've tried to do is actually try to bridge uh, this gap. So how do you bridge this gap? So, um, you know, one very important thing about grad school, I mean, really at the end of the day, uh, I love my project, I love my PhD thesis, but who really cares about the small protein I work on? Like the real value, I think, is I learn how to learn. And I dare anybody in the, in the audience that have, uh, just to realize that how quickly you can learn. Compare, think about, you know, um, five years ago, like if you're put in front of a problem that you had absolutely no clue what to do. Like these skills that you learn are extremely, extremely valuable. And I think not a lot of people realize that. Um, one other great thing that I was very fortunate to get during my PhD, and I also applied uh, for uh, that to my business, uh, my, my business, to gain some business background, is to get a mentor. Uh, and what I mean by a mentor is someone that really genuinely wants to help you and that you feel very comfortable with. You feel comfortable asking you know, easy question, you feel, you feel really comfortable being dumb in front because you say, you know what, I don't, really don't know that, just teach me. And that's very important because these are the questions that are going to come back uh, later down the line. And one of the things that uh, Teresa was talking about is um, how to break this vicious cycle, cycle of I don't have any experience. And trust me, I, I went through that for a whole year. Like, you don't have any experience, you don't have any experience. So basically, Volunteering, I would ar arguably, is for me the best way to break that vicious circle because by volunteering, not only you're going to get the knowledge, but you're also going to get the network. So um, I was trying to summarize like the last year and a half and how uh, how can I summarize this in, in a very concise way? And I kind of came up with this idea of having like the top five most frustrating responses I got when I was job searching, um, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, can identify to that. So the first one, obviously, well, you don't have any experience. Um, you don't have any knowledge on the subject. Very, very common. Um, you just try to call or you try to email and people don't get back to you and then you think they're upset at you or they don't care. And obvious, often and most often, they don't care. So you have to find a way to actually make them care. And you also get a bunch of canned responses like, oh, we're not hiring right now. Um, just go do an MBA and come back. And um, the last one I, I got a few times, and it's like when, they, when people call back or when they answer the phone, they don't really know who you are. So, um, so that's kind of a bad thing. Um, how do you, <laughs> you should, they should know who you are before you call. So um, how do you address these responses? Uh, well, number one, I think, again, volunteer. And, you know, be very passionate. Like you've, volunteering is not something you just do to tick on your resume, to put on your resume. Volunteering is very, you're trying to convey the message that you're very passionate about what you do and you like it. And the way you're going to sell yourself afterwards, like, yeah, I know I've done that and I know that I like it. So it's, it's much safer for your employer also to hire you if they know you've been in the industry and you're actually not going to bail after two months because, uh, you know, it's just not like grad school and you cannot wake up at 10.30 every, uh, every morning. You actually have to be to work at 8.30 in the morning. Um, another good thing, uh, is find transferable skills. And transferable skills is very, very wide. Um, it can be very, very wide because, like I said, like learning how to learn, like this is a transferable skill. Being put in front of a problem or anything that you don't have a clue, and you can say to your boss, well, give me a couple of hours, give me a day or two, and I'll figure it out. There's not a lot of people that can do that. And with the, the training that you get, try to find these transferable skills that you can really, really sell yourself. Um, also, you know, we all have a little bit of geeks in us, so learning is, is something we like to do. Uh, so, it's, you know, when you, you look at these, you know, thousands of other candidates, like, try to, to think about, you know, like, learning, I like learning, and this is what drives me. So a lot of people are only going to have a job because they're comfortable, it's a nine-to-five job, but try to step outside the box and say, you know what, I want to have a job where I'm uncomfortable because I know how to learn, and I enjoy it. Um, 
So for the uh, number four, I uh, can responses, and um, I got that a, a few times, and I, I was able to get around that because if you have a good network, and you uh, you get to that same person via via one of your network, you'll be very very surprised how the, the answer changes. And you know, I, 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 at the other at, at the other end, I mean, these people they're very busy. So if they don't know you, they don't have any relationship with you. Of course, they're going to give you a can answer. If you go to one of your network, it might open a lot of doors. And the who are you thing, it shouldn't really happen. Like you have to, you should do your homework properly. And, and this one is really, is really your fault if it happens. So um, another thing I want to talk about, and it's, again, I, I will not stress how important that is. It's the whole networking thing. And one of my goal today is actually to break the stigma because, um, at least in academia, um, there's kind of a bad, there could be a bad, um, uh, a negative connotation about, about networking. Like it's kind of like, you know, I don't want to kiss butt, or I don't want to, you know, lower myself to ask people some things. And it's really, really not that. Like, and if there's one sentence that I think uh, r summarizes this whole evening, it's actually the last one here. It's by a book I really like called Never Eat Alone. It's the real currency of networking, or the currency of real networking. It's not greed, but generosity. So when you network, it's not about asking someone something. It's really about knowing the other person and establishing a contact. And these people, maybe they won't have anything to give you in the next you know, six months, year, two years, or three years. But down the line, you'll, very, you'll be surprised how many, if you build a big Rolodex of people that you know, how you can get things done for you, and you can also get things done for your friends. And this is what networking is all about. So again, trying to summarize networking, I was, I was thinking of a, of a way to put it. And I, I kind of came into with this little matrix here where you, know, you can kind of separate your connection into two different parts. The level of, that per, of connection of that person and the deg degree of comfort you have in that person. And in the lower quadrant, let's say, you know, this person has a very small amount of connections and you don't really know that person. So this is what I call like the C-level contact. So people you do social networking in, for example, like your LinkedIn, you met that person once and they added you to your LinkedIn. You don't really remember who they are, but you know, it makes you look cool because you have 200 contacts on your LinkedIn. Um, this is kind of the, the, the lowest priority, I would say, networking. Then you move on <coughs> pardon me, with people that maybe don't have a lot of connections, but are very, are very close to you, so mentors or friends. And these people are important because that's the people that you can actually you know, go a step further into, into asking for more, uh, more advice. Um, and I think that, you know, d despite the level of connection that these people have, you know, it's, it's very important never to burn bridges. Um, even if that person, you don't see any value in talking to that person, again, that shouldn't be the point. That, that should be the point. And never, never br burn bridges because, again, you never know when that person is going to come back. The, um, the other um, network, uh, the, the other quadrant that I'm, I'm talking about, this is the delicate one. It's what I call the home run contact. This is someone that you're not very comfortable with, but that's someone that can really, really help you. So you kind of have one shot or two that you can give that person a call and ask for a favor. So keep these ones very close, but don't overuse them because, uh, again, because they have a lot of contact, you don't want to be too, uh, too aggressive because that can play against you as well. And again, like the last one is obviously uh, the mentor. So you know, if you find one, find two, find three uh, mentors, and that's going to take you a very, very long way. Um, some of these are obvious. Some of these are not. Um, the do's and don'ts of networking. I got that from, a, from an article uh, that I found very interesting. And uh, it's basically a laundry list. I, I don't really want to go through all of them, because I mean, that's going to be available. And, um, but a few of them I, I really want to point out. So like if you, um, let's say if you call someone or you use one of your contacts uh, in an email, for instance, like it's always good to say, if you have a link to someone else, you always say, well, so-and-so suggested I contacted you. So that way you kind of like f create this, this feeling of, of the guy's going to read your email, he's going to be, well, yeah, I have to reply to this person because if I don't, th that so-and-so uh, might be upset. So that's always a good thing to do. Um, it, learn to cold call. Like personally, I'm, big, I'm not a big fan of cold calling. Uh, I think you have to have a very specific skill not to sound too sleazy, which uh, I tried a few times and I just I can do it. So, um, but if you, if you have this, 
uh, this gift of being able to cold call someone without sounding like a telemarketer, um, I would, uh, I would uh, suggest you to do it. But try to stick to the email or just the personal face-to-face. -face. Nothing, like, nothing beats a handshake. Um, when you call people, make sure you, you really think about it before. And even personally, I write a list of things that I need to talk about because so often you get carried away and uh, you're going to find something very interesting or you're going to be nervous. So you really do have to write a list. I really ask, you know, like before calling, I'm going to write down a list, like the th things I need, yeah, what kind of information I need from that person, uh, what kind of advice or referral. So always end, if that person cannot help you, for instance, like Teresa said, people genuinely want to help usually, but maybe they just can't or they don't know how. So often what I would do is like, well, do you know anybody who can? Or could you refer me to someone who can? And usually you build your network very, very easily uh, like that. And um, on the phone, uh, number seven here on the phone, try not to, to, to talk too much because uh, showing that you're concise and precise in what you want to talk about is a very good skill and it's something that employers are also going to look for. They don't want someone who goes on forever and ever, like I'm kind of doing right now. <laughs> so, um, so I was, to kind of illustrate the importance of networking, I just uh, draw a little timeline here of uh, when I first started in science and all the way to, to today. Um, so when I started in science, uh, I had this uh, this family friend who, was, who became a mentor of me scientifically. And, uh, you know, I was not the guy who had the best grades uh, in undergrad. I was not, you know, but this person really took me under his wing and taught me about lab work, taught me about research. And because of that, I was, you know, I applied here, great program, I got in, uh, and I really, I really enjoyed it. And again, I did it before, so I knew my pitch to my supervisor was, you know what? I've been working in labs for three years now as an undergrad, and I know I like it, so it's pretty safe for you to hire me. Um, so, and I was one of the first students, so he was kind of desperate too, so that helps. <laughs> so, and again, the relationship never burn bridges. Like, I know like within academia, some, some supervisor will be a bit worried about if you want to leave academia, you want to go to do business, or you're moving to the big evil world of business. Um, I believe that if you foster a relationship with your supervisor soon enough and you don't turn that into kind of a battle, it can be very helpful. My supervisor, for instance, was super helpful uh, in giving me my first job and, and, and again, he was a great reference for my job that I have right now. So in, um, in 2004, I, uh, I stumbled upon the, this, this gentleman who was, who was very interested in science, didn't have a science background, an older gentleman, and we just started talking at an event, and um, we, we just, I explained him what I wanted to do. I was thinking about doing, jumping to business, and this person became my biggest mentor. And still again, I still have a lunch or dinner with him once every month or once every two months. And he was very instrumental in introducing me to very, very, uh, you know, good people, helpful people, and important people as well. Um, and, you know, got me uh, involved with Mars as well. So Mars Entrepreneurship 101, again, very important. Uh, I've met some great people here. Um, Tony has been very helpful, I must say. I met Teresa here. T Teresa was helpful as well. So, and again, it's just, it just going to go on and on. In 2007, I, uh, I took a part-time job that was volunteering. I was volunteering part-time. Uh, I started as an investment bank, and I was actually volunteering at the beginning. So that's <laughs> how much I wanted it. Now that I look back, I almost went insane for a year. But it paid off, and you know, I gained the knowledge, I gained, I gained the experience, and I knew that this whole science to business jump, even though I hadn't made officially the jump yet, I knew that I wasn't afraid to, to take the leap because I knew I would like it. And then finally, um, you know, as you know, words get around, you get you know, to know more people. Uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to get in a situation where I actually had three competitive job offers, so I had to pick, I had, I'd pick one, and I picked the one that I always wanted to do, which was to work for a venture capital firm. Um, I gave this talk before, and I presented that, and there's one very important thing that I forgot. And, um, and the thing I forgot is all these little steps in between, where it was very hard, and I was, it's not like it was always uh, easy, and it's, you're going to get, you know, highs and lows, and for a year, you're going to, get people that tells you, you know, you don't have experience, you can do it, but just don't discourage because, you know, 
evolutionary speaking, if 90% 90, 90 of the people drop out after the first no, there's only 10% people left. So if you persist and you persist and you persist, at the end of the day, you know, you're not against 1,000 people. You're going to be against five or six people. But persistence is probably one of the keys. So basically, in summary, uh, how to bridge the gap. And again, that's very suggestive. Your experience might be totally different. This is how I, um, I experienced it. But uh, you know, learn, learn outside of, of what you do. Just be, be proud to be a generalist. I think we tend to become specialists and be very comfortable in our specialty. But you know, it's OK to know a little bit about everything and not everything about just one thing. Um, get a mentor. Uh, try to get a mentor. And, uh, don't be afraid, another thing that I didn't mention, but don't be afraid of knowing what you don't know uh, and asking and trying to you know, build your, your skills. Because if you're afraid to admit that you don't know something, that's where actually you can basically you shut yourself in the foot because you're just becoming more this specialist person. Um, try to know where you're going, although you don't really have to. You, can, you know that you're going to a certain direction, but you don't really have to be laser focused because it's hard when you haven't experienced anything um, in terms of your first job to really know where you're going. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just networking. Be, be genuine. And, and that's another thing. Like I, just try to be genuine and honest. Like Someone who wants to network and wants something out of you, you see that person coming from miles away. It actually can hurt you much more than it can uh, be beneficial. And uh, that comes back to the other point. Try to, it's, 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 a, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky thing because you have to be very mature about it because the reputation is much harder. It's much harder to gain than it is to lose. So if you get that reputation of that person who just wants this, you know, if you feel like, you know, people feel like they have to take a shower after they talk to you because you're so sleazy, uh, that's not a good thing. And it's a small world and the, you know, world, the, the world goes around. So just be very genuine, be passionate about what you want to do. And um, you know, and I was talking about learning. Like I just put a few examples of books here. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of uh, Dan Goldman, uh, which uh, he's a big, he's like a, the, the father of, uh, of emotional intelligence. Which, and uh, Malcolm Gladwell actually in his book Outlier was very good, uh, very good about that. Um, the the take-home message of these books is really, you know, it's there's two types of, of there's the IQ and there's the what they call the EQ, the emotional intelligence. And to be a great leader and entrepreneur. The EQ plays a very big part, and arguably a bit bigger part than the IQ. Um, so we did a little survey. I don't know how we're doing with time. We maybe go very quickly. I'm just going to run through it. So we ask, I think it's 12 or 13 CEOs. And what's interesting in the survey, uh, it's very non-scientific. Uh, but um, it wasn't, it wasn't um, a multiple choice. So it's basically write down what you think are the factor for success. And the same words were coming over and over again. Um, you know, uh, again, drive and passion and leadership, networking, the top three. I think that says a lot. Uh, you know, I'm not saying you, you, don't, you don't need to be smart, but uh, you really have to be uh, passionate and, and you have to know people. It's all like business deals, it's, how, it's always done like that. It's about who you know and, um, and what you can deliver. And again, well, it's kind of the reverse. So what, what's going to inhibit your success is often, um, it's often the lack of belief in yourself and your communication skill. Um, I would probably put greed and ego much higher than this. So, uh, but uh, this is just my opinion. And uh, well, we did, this is going to be available on the website. We did a bunch of interviews. And again, I just took some, some excerpts from the interviews. And transferable skills were coming, were, was coming back all the time. Um, transferable skills, problem solving. Uh, so that's pretty much it. And that's it. So here's our contact info. And again, uh, just as a side note, a very good way to find jobs is also to talk to VCs. Because VCs invest in companies, and these companies are looking, always looking for, uh, for good people. So um, you can also ask for my card or give me yours. <laughs> Thank you.